Hi, I'm Brian Kleckner. I'm a former special operations sniper turned attorney and entrepreneur, and I'm an outlier. What's going on, everybody? This is Ever Gonzalez. This is the Outlier on Air podcast. As you know, this is the podcast where we interview founders, disruptors, and mavens. As always, I am your host. I'm very excited about it. On today's episode, we have Ryan Kleckner. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Ever. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we're we're excited to have you on for a couple of different reasons. Um, I'm just kind of I'm going to read through your your history here for a little bit. Former Army Ranger. You're an author, you're an entrepreneur, you are a, an attorney, and this is, uh, I, I mean, I don't even know where to start. So to kind of paint the picture for our audience, tell us where you're calling us from first. Well, I'm from, calling from my home in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm a transplant to the South. I moved around a bunch, but man, we love it here. So with the things that you do, right, and again, we're going to get into everything that you're doing. Uh, what are right. the pros and cons of living where you are right now as far as the business? people? The people are awesome, but the business, this is, I had no idea. So one of the things I do is I'm an author and I had no idea I transplanted myself into author Mecca. I mean, I had neighbors coming and introducing themselves to me when we moved into the house that are New York Times bestselling authors. Just, it's amazing. The street, Ingram Publishing, you know, the biggest distributor of books in the country is up the road. It was, it was completely accidental, but this is a neat place because also a lot of these community companies from New York, a lot of California companies are coming here. The city's booming because it's a trendy city. So as far as an upstart goes, uh, I got lucky. This is the place to be. Any cons? It gets a little hot and humid in the summer. It does, <laughs> but it's not that bad. I mean, I'll go back to another pro. There's no state income tax. Yeah. So that's another pro. That's, that's great. So <laughs> yeah. with, with, uh, with everything that you're doing, right, you, you were in the military. You were a sniper. Right? You I was into entrepreneurship and, and we're going to get into that. But so let, let's start from the very beginning. What was that like? Right. Man, I think every little kid dreams about being uh, a ranger or a seal and, and doing what you were doing. Um, yeah. What kind of get, got you into the military? Well, the military was an accident. So I, I, I'm going to go back to another con I real quick of Tennessee public lands. There's not enough public land here. I grew up in Arizona. I was born and raised in Arizona and there's public land everywhere. So I could go camping and hunting and fishing almost wherever I wanted. And in Tennessee, you're in somebody's backyard. So that's been a weird transition for me. Yeah. So yeah, the military was a bit of an accident. I went through high school, I had some members of the family in the military and I always been into uh, shooting guns from hunting or things like that. And you know, in the back of my mind, maybe, but went to college and like many 18, 19 year old guys, kind of useless at that age. <laughs> I, I couldn't offer much. I didn't have much going on. And on a whim, I think it was 12 days, I up and joined the military. Woke up in the armory wondering what in the world did I do? And there is more than once throughout the experience where I stopped and asked, what am I doing to myself? Or I can't believe I just did that. Like I would actually say the phrase you just said ever. I would say little kids dream of doing this. You know, sitting on the back of an airplane with a parachute and a motorcycle getting ready to jump out. Sure. I mean, that stuff's from the movies, you know? And did you enjoy it when you, while you were in there? I did. I did. Now, I didn't enjoy it that much because I got out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was fun while I was in. I left while the party was still fun. Uh, it was a great unit, a great group of guys to be with. I think for the amount of time I was in and the experience and training and courses I got could not be matched. I deployed to Afghanistan a couple times, and I just realized that the military wasn't for me for a career. And I knew if I was going to keep re-enlisting, then I was just going to be that much further behind everybody else once I got out. And since it wasn't going to be a career for me, I decided to part ways, took the GI Bill, went back to college, and that's how I ended up in law school. You said you weren't, you know, you weren't completely happy with it. I mean, it was great and, and you learned a lot of things, but you felt like you were going to fall behind a little bit. Tell us about the transition from when you decided to kind of leave the military. Did you ever sure. know what you wanted to get into? No, 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 not at all. But I, so I was worried I'd fall behind if I kept staying in. So I knew, and I still believe this, that even after years in the military, as long as it's less than 10, I believe a, a lot of guys and gals can actually be ahead of their peers. 
in a whole lot of other areas. So the problem though is when I, when I got out, all my friends went to high school with already had their degrees or already were starting to be established in their jobs. And I'm going back to be a freshman in college. Yeah. So on the time scale, I was behind, but I was that adult that was annoying to the other kids when I was in school. I was more prepared. I wanted to be there to learn. I understood that it was my money. So I think it was the only option for me, but I didn't know what I wanted to do yet. I just knew I needed a four-year degree, whether I was going to go try to be a sniper in the FBI or whether I was going to move on to something else. And so when did you decide that uh, law was, was going to be it for you? Again, on a whim, I actually had focused on medical school. So I, okay. I satisfied all my pre-medical requirements. So I suffered through organic chemistries for no reason. For no reason. Oh, for no reason. And I actually knew some doctors at the time. And life's too short. So that's something the military taught me too, is kind of go seize the day. And I'd already proven myself a bit with what I did in the military. I didn't want to start over again. And then four years of medical school and four years of residency, and then I can start paying back loans. So I was a little misguided, graduated with my degree. I was teaching at a government contracted sniper school this whole time, teaching at a community college the whole time. And I had looked at my new wife at the time and said, I'm so tired of all my stories being way back when, because we just got back from like a, a dinner party with some friends and I have all these crazy, funny stories, none of them in which I'm the hero, all of them in which I'm goofing off or doing something silly in the military. And I was just tired of them all being past stories. I didn't have my next new challenge and it was stressing me out. And she brought it up. You ever think about law school? I don't know. We opened the laptop right then and said, huh, let's go to law school. Just like that. Yeah. So a lot of my decisions in life have been on a whim and they've, they've worked out. Okay. So law school. And then, I, I mean, what, what's, what's the story? I, I, you're an author, right? So tell yeah. us how, how you got into doing that. Was that a whim as well? Actually, it was. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, uh, I uh, law school, I ended up my first summer internship, sort of working for a trade association. So I was working while I was going to law school and then I got involved in the firearms industry. I ended up going and working for one of the major manufacturers and I ran compliance and things like that for him. I was an attorney for this major company and I was traveling nonstop. It was like four years of just nonstop travel and stress and they paid me for it. It was great, but it was just too much, especially with young kids. And I said, you know what, enough's enough. I'm gonna hang out my own shingle and practice law on my own. And right when I quit, I still had a bunch of good feedback from a lot of the online videos I had done on YouTube for people in our industry that they liked them so much that I broke things down simply. And I just wanted my CV to say that I wrote a book. I mean, that's kind of cool to say, right? Oh, yeah, I wrote a book. Absolutely. Who cares if my mom and my best friend are the only two people that bought it? You know, at least I can say I wrote a book. And so everyone said, write on what you know, and I know long range shooting. So I sat down and took two months and I hacked out a book called The Long Range Shooting Handbook. That's as simple as a title as I can get. I made the title, kind of the cover bright orange so people could see it on Amazon. And uh, I reached out to a bunch of publishers and they all turned me down. So I self-published. I put it up on Amazon and it's been a little over two years now and it's been the number one bestseller in its category the entire time. Was that, was that a surprise for you? Yes. It, that is not false humility. If it was going to be that successful, I would not have taken every picture in the book with my iPhone. <laughs> which I really did. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, so it's been, it's yeah, sold 42, 43,000 copies to date. Very nice. And thank you. And That's there's it. actually been a couple, it is, it's just, as it took off, I actually right away went, oh no, did I proofread that well enough? Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. So, so yeah, it was that, the, way, the way that, to go. That takes off, right? Uh, other, uh -huh. you have uh, other books that, uh, that you're working on that. Uh, yep. That yeah. Working on other books. I write a lot of articles. I do things like that. And what's nice about writing is, one, it's a creative outlet. It gives you a chance to build something. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm stuck behind a computer so much every day yeah. that the phone calls and the emails come in and out and then the day's over and you don't have anything to show for it. That's what's nice about a book because you have something to leave behind. And to all the listeners, please go write a book. You all know something that you're a subject matter in that would help somebody else. And by writing and self-publishing your own book, it takes two seconds. It's easy to do. It's just amazing. So like right now I'm writing a children's firearm safety book that'll hopefully be out by the time this airs just because I can, why not? Just because you can do it. And, and obviously you've proven to be uh, somewhat successful at it. So. Right. Well, those, those publishers did come back to me. Oh, did they really? <laughs> oh now yeah. 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 A couple, a, a, yeah. a couple months later they came back and I'm like, oh, no, no, thank yeah. you. I got yeah. this. I got this on my own. Thanks. Do it. So this yeah. next thing I self publish. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I don't think I, I might use a publisher. I don't want to say never, but if you can figure it out and it took some time, but once you figure it out, self-publishing is it's the new future.
It's, it's instantly, just like this podcast is we're talking right into people's ears. Self-publishing is a direct connection between you and the customer. Great. You, you have more control too, right? Without a doubt. Without uh, a doubt. So what I like about your story so far, and obviously, you know, we, we've done our research and, and um, know what you've done and, and what you're working on. But up until this point in this, in this episode, military guy, went mm-hmm. to school, right? You, you thought it was going to be medical uh, school or you were looking to, to yeah. get, mm-hmm. and then you're an attorney. Nowhere in there, and then you become an, uh, an author. Nowhere in there have I heard anything about any type of entrepreneurship training or desire at that point. Where, where does that all come mm. in? Well, maybe. I, so the, the hanging out my own shingle to be my own lawyer, that's entrepreneurish, okay. I guess. The book sure. is a little entrepreneurial, except I didn't really think that was going to be a business, to be honest. You know, so I, I donate 25% of the book's proceeds to charity. And that was a better idea also until it started selling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good cause. I'm yeah, happy to do it. But there's, there's been a couple of times where you're writing a check. You're like, Oh, that hurts. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, but it's a, it's a good cause. So no, that's been entrepreneur spirit. And it really kicked off the most when I tried to represent my own clients. And I realized that I had to fight a giant pool of potential clients. So for me, in my world, it was compliance, boring to everybody, but exciting to me. And there's a limited number of people in the firearms industry that need compliance help. And there's a couple big firms out there. And here I am, this little fish. I, I had a big name in the industry, but I still, for a firm size, was tiny. I had to go out there and start duking it out with them to try and fight over this limited pool. And it actually hit me not long after I put the book out. And I got the spark of, hey, I can do this. I can churn this money. This actually works on my own. That I got the idea, instead of fighting for the number of clients that are currently in the pool, what if I could just make the pool bigger? And I thought about it and went, well, wait a minute. If someone needs a federal firearms license, you know, they need to be a gun dealer or a gun manufacturer before they can be my client. Why don't I just help people get their federal firearms licenses? Nice. So I started a company called Rocket FFL and it was dipped my toe into online training. And so I put an online course together to help people navigate how to get their federal firearms license. And so what I was able to do is take this figurative box, if you will, and set it to the side of me. And it was a machine that just churned out new potential clients for me every single day because now they've proven that they're willing to pay for information. They now trust me because I'm the one that taught them the information and they're likely to be the most unsophisticated clients. That's not to say to prey on anybody. I don't want that to be taken wrong, but they, they know they don't know everything or else they wouldn't have paid for the course. How did so, that, how did that work early on? Did it take off right away? Did it, did you, it really did. It, it's, it's the traffic and, and figuring out SEO the right way and things like that, of course, is difficult to get it going because everyone's trying to do the same thing. But yes, it, it actually took off enough that I'm able to focus even more on my other projects and turn down the clients. So everyone I can talk to and explain this is stop and ask yourself, what's the difference between your neighbor and one of your clients? And then what does it take to get your neighbor to become one of your clients? And whatever that gap is, maybe you should focus on that. Because yeah. making your own pool of clients is the way to go. And so it feels like obviously this, this, this worked. Um, you're not mm-hmm. stopping. I mean, th- this is something that you want to continue to do, right? Th- these type of training. Uh, Absolutely. T- tell so us about the, the, what I'm, I'm kind of calling it mailbox money, if you will, is the recurring income of the book is, well, wait a minute. It's, it's a really hard two months and I probably would take longer than two months next time. But that really hard chunk of work, once it's over and it's done, I can now move on to project number two and project one keeps paying me because here's the problem with being an attorney. You can charge a lot per hour and I charge a lot per hour, but I've still got to work that hour. You can't scale it, right? Right. You can't at all. And that's that's one of these lessons that entrepreneurs have all figured out that I haven't (laughs) is exactly you can't scale hourly labor because there's only one of me and I can only do so much. And then you you know what the rest of your, your career is going to be like. It's going to be a lot, a lot of work. We're now, while we're doing this podcast, I'm making the same amount of money I made the hour before the podcast because I'm setting up these streams and I really encourage there are multiple streams. You know, don't put all them in one basket, but I can have that book out. That can be churning. I can be working on the second book and that can be churning. I can throw up a course that can be churning and you can just keep adding these things and I treat them almost like properties, like real estate that I'm investing in and they can all start paying off as I go. Okay, let's talk about time then. What, how much time are you spending being an attorney? And, and we're still talking about all these other different projects that you have going on, um, uh, time that you spend on that. 
I'm hardly an attorney at all now. Really? Yeah. How long I'm is the that? attorney. How's that been going on? It has been six, seven months ago. I was with, when I hung up my own shingle, I also joined with a bigger firm to get clients and work with clients through them. I left them about six, eight months ago. Don't remember the exact time frame to be fully on my own. And it's great. Now, I don't regret going to law school or becoming an attorney. And I don't turn it off completely. So I'm planning on bringing on some clients here and there. But again, I can't scale those hours. And instead, I can do this. I'm, I'm so much happier this way. Take us back to the conversation that you had with the family saying, hey, I'm going to leave this somewhat, or you know, this, this <laughs> steady paycheck, right? Yeah. That, that, I've, that I've been working on for a while to now do your own thing. What was that like? How'd that go over? My wife was relieved. She was the one begging oh, me. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I actually had kind of quit the job twice. It was kind of funny. So it was a so billion dollar company. I was a vice president in the company. Uh, and this is kind of my biggest mistake. So we might as well roll into that. My biggest entrepreneurial mistake is I, or not entrepreneurial business mistake, is I chased what I'm calling the LinkedIn game right? I wanted to get the coolest looking resume on LinkedIn in the back of my head. Like, oh, look, I'm comparing myself to this person and look at my title and look at my salary. And man, my bonus this year was more than I got paid annually at my last job. Look how awesome I am. And I was miserable. I wasn't home. I, it was the biggest mistake in the world. So she was hoping I was going to quit. And honestly, the reason it took me so long was not necessarily fear. That's kind of everyone's got that. It was I had to stop being selfish. I was blaming or using my family as a reason why I couldn't quit. Yeah, I don't know right. if that makes any sense. Sure, absolutely. So I was being selfish about it and being like, oh, I know you guys want me to quit, but I can't quit because I have to take care of you guys. Mm -hmm. Well, really, that's wrong. They were the yeah. ones that wanted more time with yeah. me. And they're the ones that are happy now that I'm not on four, four flights a week or, or, or going crazy all over the country, that I can actually take off in the middle of the day if I want. You know, it's funny, it, my, so my background's in logistics. I spent 15 years or so um, all, sort, all over the, the West Coast in, in logistics. Finally quit that after I sold my last company to work on Outlier, right? It's been five years or so. Um, mm -hmm. In the beginning, making a lot less, but being a lot happier. I had the freedom to be with the family, or right? I had a growing family. And, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm home whenever I want to be home now. Right. I, I'm, I think back, if I was still in that industry, I could be doing amazing things and still running other companies. I'm all right. I'm loving this. Talking yeah. to entrepreneurs like you, right? Being at, at soccer games for my kids and just being able to, to live and make money, but not have to worry about, man, I got to put in 60 hours at the office this week or else whatever. Now, I, st I still put in the crazy hours and I need to stop because it's almost worse if you're not careful being on your own because you want to get too many projects done. Yeah. And I've, I've really been struggling with where in my mind is it enough that I can coast might not be the right word, but throttle back a little bit. Well, let's and get into that. I don't that. know where that is yet. The, let's get into that. You're, you're right in the middle of it. You're in the trenches. You were talking about, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you have uh, what Mayday Safety, a, a new app, yeah. right? Well, yeah. We'll, we'll get into the, those details in just a sec, but when does it stop? I don't know. You yeah. don't know. <laughs> you see, I, <laughs> Ever, that's not even half, I think, of the projects I'm working on right I now. I bet, I bet. It's just, is, it's what I, I am, I had never known it till now that I'm an entrepreneur at heart. You know, I, I hear of topics and go, ooh, there's an idea for potential business. Yeah. And well, I that think- That happened when we were offline here just a second ago. Exactly right. Yeah, I have that drive. And a good thing about that drive is that's what will separate me from people that have good ideas and not want to act. But the bad thing about that drive is I don't know when to say no. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's tough. Yeah. Well, you know, I guess we're all trying to figure that out. Now, Lynn, let's talk about Mayday Safety. It's a new app. Okay. Tell us about it. Oh, I'm so excited. Thanks for bringing it up. It is something that was born uh, based on a conversation last year before there was that church shooting at Texas. It was before that shooting. I was talking with my neighbors who work in the healthcare industry, and he's a former minister. And he started talking about how there were issues with church safety and how we needed to improve church safety. So I started thinking, ooh, online courses. Maybe we can put together safety plans and safety training and this and that. And he said, yeah, like something that teaches everybody to go hide behind the pews in case an active shooter happens. And I went, no, no, that's the worst thing ever. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, everybody needs to turn and charge the person and throw their hymnal books at them. That'd be way <laughs> more successful than just hiding on the floor. Uh -huh. And he thought about it. He goes, oh, that is interesting. And so we started talking about some of the special operations principles that apply here. And I said, and then, I mean, if you had a way to communicate between, because it was still on churches at the time, between 
the main worship hall, if something happened, how in the world do you let the Sunday school teachers know that are multiple right. buildings over that there's a problem? And then even more so, how do you know that they got the message and that they're checking in safe? I said, oh, we could make an app that da da da. My partner said, that's it. We need to make that dashboard, that control board on the app. And the company's completely morphed. We, we chalked that up to sitting around a, a fire with glasses of whiskey. And then the Texas shooting happened a couple of days later. And we texted each other and said, you really want to do this? And let's do it. Since then, we've been going full blast on it. And it's working now. And uh, so it, I'm not sure when this is going to go out. I'm not sure when this is going to go out. But if on, the, on May 15th, the app will be free and live in the app store. And the dashboard for the organizations will be ready June 1st. And we've gone through rounds of beta testers and we just found so many uses. Every time we show an organization or show somebody this, I mean, the individuals love that in the app, they can add their family members and anywhere in their world, anything happens to a family member and they hit the mayday button. Everyone else in the family gets a pin on a map exactly where they're at. gets the oh, emergency shoot. details. Really? It incorporate. Yeah. So I hear like Cincinnati, Ohio, two weeks ago, there was a boy that died. He got trapped in the back of his van. Did you hear about that? No. A third row seat collapsed on him while he was reaching for his tennis racket. He called 911 twice by Siri because he couldn't reach his phone. They couldn't find his exact location and he died. And so when I hear stuff like that, I'm like, oh, we got to hurry up and get Mayday out because you're going to be able to say, hey, Siri, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. And it I actually just did it <laughs> on my phone. Um, it's going to be able to send that message out to everyone nearby to all your family members and to whatever organization you belong to. So if you're at part of the school, the school campus on the map, a pin goes right up on the, their dashboard and they can communicate with you and they can decide to spread it to the whole campus or uh, the teachers at a school, when they get it, they can know to lock the door immediately and they can check in safe or check in with help. So when law enforcement shows up, they can see who's safe and who needs the help to save precious time. So, right, and it sounds like a great idea. Why wouldn't people want it? Because it's a great idea, I'm assuming there are other big boys in that space already with, with these type of apps. I, I, I don't know. Similar. That's, that's been our biggest concern is we've, we're used to hearing no on ideas. And we're actually nervous that every meeting we've had, <laughs> within 15 or 20 minutes, the customer's saying, giving us ideas on how it's better. Really? We're like, oh, great. Well, aren't you supposed to say no? Like, push yeah. back here. And we look at each other a lot and ask if we're drinking our own Kool-Aid. There are some big companies out there and some big solutions out there but most of them only give out an alert, similar to like a fire alarm, just says, hey, there's a problem. It doesn't allow for the message back, locked down safe, or need extra help, or for communication, or some of them only work for one organization. So like a university will buy it, it only works for that university. This, the idea is it works at your workplace, at your church, at your school, for your family. So we'll see. Um, so you already have customers that have signed up, right? So you've had beta testers, but are, are you already in the selling process? Are, are you getting people signed up? No. Nope. Well, we're getting people signed up because I told them I'm not going to release it till June 1st. So I have the waiting list of people trying to yank it out of our hands, which is a weird spot to be in because yeah. everyone I talk to about a tech app is don't worry about revenue, worry about users. Yep. And they're actually trying to talk me off of the revenue and I'm pushing back a little bit by saying, but why? If the revenue is there, why should I turn it down? And we've struggled with the idea on what to allow in the app. Like we, both my partner and I have our own businesses. We have our own successful lives. Honestly, if we just made the world safer and that'd be enough. Now, I don't mind making money off the deal, but we struggled with what we were going to give away free and what we're going to charge for. And just last week, right before the launch, we decided, you know what? Let's just give the world the app for free. We were going to charge for families. We decided not to. We're like, just let everyone have their families for free. Let everyone have it for free. And we're doing the math on what that's going to cost us on server load. And we're just crossing our fingers that enough businesses will sign up to support it. Yeah. So free to the individual, but the enterprise wise, you're, you're charging the organizations. Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, you're in, but you've talked about going into these organizations and everybody's kind of still happy about it. Everybody wants to. Yes. Yes. What's so wrong? It could not work when it needs to. Okay. And someone could get hurt. Yeah. And so not only is that bad enough that somebody got hurt, uh, it's as far as a company in PR, well, oh, let sure. me back up a second. One of the hard things about this company is we have to keep forgiving ourselves when we talk about these horrible instances, because you say seeing so many times, oh, heaven forbid, we finally have to stop just saying heaven forbid. But sometimes we sound heartless. I don't have to sound that way is yeah, it could, someone could try to use it. It fails somehow. And then PR wise, we're, we're dead in the water or two, somebody bad uses it. 
And so we, we try to work a lot with, okay, what happens when the school shooter helps the app? Because our whole theme for the company is crowdsourcing safety. So we want every student to have the app. We want every teacher yeah. to have it. And so now what happens if the student has it? And it's all been designed by all my special operations buddies. And we've all come to the conclusion, good, let them have it. Let the school shooter have the app in his phone. And when he approaches the building and his phone goes off with a crazy alert, he knows he's done. He knows that every room just got locked down and everybody knows he's there. We actually are okay with that, but we're, we're, we're trying to work through every scenario. What's, what's going to happen if this takes off? I mean, are, are you willing to put more time and effort and resources into it? Without a doubt. I'm also willing to take a check. <laughs> I mean, I'd, 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 I'd love to keep running this. My passion is in building this and helping people. I know that sounds corny, but it's really true. Uh, but we just talked about how much of an entrepreneur I am. Yeah. So I'm already ready to jump onto the next idea. So I need to stay focused on this one. And I'm at the phase right now, Ever, where we're almost to our limit, or if not, we are there, on what we can do to the company. We've okay. realized we, we need to bring some people on that know this industry because it exploded faster than we thought it was going to. The waiting list of companies that have signed up is much bigger than we expected. I mean, our biggest customer is a state. A state government is buying it yeah. from us. Very nice. Uh, my gosh, we're two that's guys. That's a full-time job right there. <laughs> that's right. a full-time for job for 20 people. people. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah. We're, we're trying to scale that too. And we look at, okay, what kind of burn can we have on the overhead of people? And then what people do we bring in? You know, yeah. We need the co-founder that says, yeah, Ryan, I know you think you need sales, but you don't. What you need is you know, technical support or X, Y, Z. Yeah. Good luck. This is going to be one of those <laughs> things where, right. Obviously we're capitalists, right? We, we want to make some money off of this. It, it feels like, yeah. but, but it also feels like it's a passion project too, where oh, even yeah. if you break even, like you'd, I, I feel like you'd be comfortable with that for the most part to help the community, families, without churches, a doubt, schools. without a doubt. And not even for my ego. Cause if I just broke even and it was wildly successful, I'd have the little ego check mark of, hey, I was the founder yeah, of this yeah. and I helped make the world a safer place. But no, just to make it better, I was just talking earlier today with one of uh, my clients and beta testers. One of the, they're using it in their company and he was in Jordan. I said, hey, do me a favor, send me a mayday. And we were playing back and forth and just having fun with it. And he was just rolling on the ideas of, oh my gosh, you mean I could tell my salesman if there's a problem? And it just, I don't know, it makes me happy that it might be able to help. Hey, let, let's talk about you personally right now. What, with all the things that you got going on, all the things that you've been trained in, what are you the best at right now? Oh, probably still shooting. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm an amateur entrepreneur. I've, I have succeeded in what I'm doing. I am, I'm doing just as good or better than I was before. I have succeeded by accident. And I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. I mean, even publishing the book, it took me a year to get it right. I was making sales while I was doing things wrong. And I think that's advice I give people. Um, I hope it's not wrong is just go with what you got and figure it out as you go. Cause if you sit and wait for it to be perfect, it'll never be there. You know, I even put in my book, uh, if there's typos in here or there's something I explained uh -huh. poorly, uh -huh. reach out to me. And if you're correct, I'll include it in the next edition and I'll add your name as a thanks. That's good. And I think in the current edition of the book, there's a footnote with five guys names saying special <laughs> thanks to these guys. Oh, really? But had I not done that, and I waited till it was perfect, I would have missed out on all the sales and opportunity. So it's, it's working, right? With the things that you got going on, I mean, there's no, I don't see any challenges other than maybe having too many things that you got working on. Right? Yeah, well, I have too many things. And the other challenge is I don't know what the potential for each plan is. So I've, I struggle with sitting back and going on my whiteboard and listing out all these projects. And when I talk to you, it seems like, oh, look at me. I got all this stuff figured out. I'm this successful entrepreneur. I'm not. It sounds like I even convinced myself I am on this podcast, but I'm not. I stress, I worry. I don't think I'm doing enough. I don't think this is going to be successful enough. Uh, I worry too much. And one of my problems is I need to learn which stream is maybe worth killing off, which potential project or has reached its potential and is not worth my time. But my mistake is I'll see something on the website I don't like and I'll dive in there and I'll blink and five hours have passed Yeah. when I could have been putting that into another project. I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with that, right? Because we all kind of start off as, for the most part, solopreneurs, right? We're, we're wearing all mm -hmm. the hats. And then when we start to actually have some success and, and the company's growing, we sometimes forget to 
how to delegate this stuff uh, yeah. because the CEO, the founder, whatever you're the best at, do that. You shouldn't be working on a website or working oh, on yeah. all these other things, right? But, but I'll it's answer hard. that question better that you asked earlier. I was just saying in life is shooting, but yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, better yeah. at getting the idea going and then handing it off. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I fundamentally know what I'm worth per hour. That's what yeah. attorneys know. Yeah. And then when I spend all that time on the website, just tinkering, <laughs> I stop and say, I could have paid X amount of dollars oh, sure. and worked somewhere else. I'm, I'm definitely bad at that. I need to get better at it. Okay. When we have you back on the show in three years, what right. are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about my next book because I don't think I'm ever going to stop writing. We're going to talk about all the mistakes I learned from on May Day when it hiccuped out of the gate, but I still recovered and it was successful. And I don't know what the next project after that will be. Who knows? You won't know the day before. I mean, it sounds like <laughs> stuff comes at you all the time. Now, are, are you investing in, in um, other people, other companies at this point? Or, or is it just you bring them on and then you kind of take over or you work on them yourself? I work on it myself. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's actually, so some of the projects I've started with is either other people have an idea and I come in, I say, you know, I've learned these lessons before. I'd be willing to help you out, but I'm so addicted to that mailbox money mentality is I don't charge people per hour anymore. So uh, someone did this with me and I'm glad they did it is they came along and said, Hey, I can help you with X, Y, and Z, but I'd like this small percentage. And that, that's, that's been way better for me and for them too. You know, I'd like that your, your entire story right now in, in this episode has been one of kind of just, Hey, if I like it and I want to go, do, I just go do it. Right. And I, and I yeah. figure it out and sometimes it's successful and sometimes it's not, but no matter what, I learned a lesson. Yeah. I, I learned for my next venture or my next idea or project. Well, um, and I stopped doing it. Yeah. So I've had people say to me, man, look at all these, this is going to sound horrible. I'm actually picking on myself here. But trust me. Wow. Why are you good at all these things you do? Oh, I'm only good at like two or three things. I'm horrible at a lot more. I can't sing. <laughs> I learned that and I don't sing. Yeah. Right. So I just, I'm all about making the mistake, but I'm a big believer in that. The, the mantra that you can't steer a parked car. I don't believe in sitting still and wondering what I should do. I have no problem taking a lunge one direction and realizing once I've moved a little bit and I have a new perspective that maybe I need to correct, I just make the correction and move on. Okay. We have a lot of entrepreneurs in the trenches that have a company, multiple projects, whatever, right? That, that uh, all over the world that are, that are listening to you right now. Overall, with all of your experiences, what's the number one piece of advice that you would give them? Something that would get them to that next level. Besides the creating your own customers, my next advice would be to set goals, not in the have goals in your life sense, but set goals so you know if you're on course or not. So the problem is when you get into the trenches like you and I are ever, and, and we do, and we talk about you can put your head down and pick your head up and blink and hours have gone by or months have gone by, it's easy to lose track of where you were going. So to use an analogy, if you're on one hilltop and you have a map and you're trying to get to the next hilltop, when you're down in the bottom and in the trees, in the trenches, you can't see where you're going anymore and it's easy to get lost. So always be able to refer back to that map so you know how to get to that next hilltop until you can see around again. So I'm not as big on goal setting as, come on, you can do it, Tiger, yeah. set that goal. No, I'm big on goal setting so you can stop and ask yourself, in the next month, I want to have this accomplished. And the entire month, you should be able to look up at that whiteboard and go, oh, that's right, I'm supposed to be walking north. And then in a month, if you get there, you don't, fine, but at least you can keep track of what you're doing or else, it's too easy to get lost. I like that. Right? We, we've seen, because of how many episodes we've done, and, and we also host a lot of entrepreneurial events, things like that. We come across and we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs that have wasted months and sometimes years with their head down, walking in circles because of that. It, yeah. it, it's so important, and, and it's, it can happen to any of us. And, and it happens in, little, in smaller chugs uh, sometimes. Yeah. But I, I like that advice. Thanks. But ask yourself, what do you want? You want the best course on this topic? Great. I'm going to come to you after a week of you stressing about your website and say, what are you doing? I'm going to make my website better. How does that help you have the best course? Yeah. Well, it doesn't, but it gets more people to my course. I want to say, stop, make the best course. Then your next goal can be, how do I get more people to my course? Yeah. It, it, it sounds so simple, but, but we struggle with it. And I'm glad that we have these type of conversations because it reminds us that we need to kind of get back on track or, or uh, focus on these little things that are make us, they're going to make us better or make our companies better. Uh, right. so, important. so thank you for that. Now, for those that are listening, they want to 
uh, get to know you a little bit better, want to connect online, where, where can we find you? One hub to see everything I have going on is my personal website, just ryankleckner.com. That's Kleckner, C-L-E-C-K-N-E-R. And they can see about all these projects. And I appreciate it if they think Mayday Safety sounds like something cool for them and their family. Go try it out and let me know. Remember, I'm the guy that's willing to put it out and it's not quite right yet. And I'm counting on you to tell me what is right and I'll make it that way. Fantastic. So outliers, you can go to outlierhq.com. That's outlierhq.com. First of all, subscribe to the podcast, rate, review it share with your friends, uh, but there you're going to find Ryan's uh, website, social media links, reach out to him. He's the real deal, has amazing stories and no doubt that he's going to come up with a bunch of other stuff to, uh, uh, to work on and things that we can kind of look at. Uh, you know, listen, we're, we're really excited about Mayday Safety. It sounds like it's something that's, that's obviously needed in, in America today, but uh, we wish you much success. Uh, we're going to be following you every step of the way and we'll have you back on the show in three years to talk about it. Man, thanks for having me on ever. Take care. Absolutely. Ryan, we'll see you. Bye, Lars. We'll talk to you tomorrow.